you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, talking today about our, our biofuels business. What I want to do is a little bit of context around uh, why BP is doing biofuels. Um, then talk a little bit more, because it's a section on future fuels, about some of the advanced biofuels activities we're involved in. Uh, and then finally, just round off with some work we're doing through our corporate venturing activity uh, in looking at uh, fuels beyond liquid transportation fuels, particularly uh, vehicle electrification, because uh, that's an important thing for us to understand as an oil company. If we don't understand the dynamics of the EV market, uh, then we could potentially uh, uh, be taken to the cleaners around our conventional liquid transportation fuels business. There are three main drivers for the, uh, for the adoption of, uh, of biofuels uh, and for the adoption of renewable energies more generally. And I think we're all very familiar with those, one of which is climate change, uh, one of which is energy security, and particularly in the case of biofuels, it's about kind of rural economic development. Uh, and that's something that's potentially quite sort of underlooked uh, when we consider um, alternative, uh, alternative fuels. And it's been a very important point for us uh, in terms of stimulating farming and agriculture and essentially kind of new businesses in, uh, in rural areas, particularly in the US and also, uh, also in Brazil. The, the two other um, conditioning factors, which are climate change and, and security supply, I think we're all pretty familiar with those. They tend to kind of... Um, one tends to be ahead of the other in terms of the pecking order from time to time. And in terms of the development of biofuels, energy security, I think it's probably just in the lead at the moment. And in terms of the two largest biofuel producing um, areas, the US and Brazil, they were in effect stimulated by energy security issues. And for those of you familiar with the Brazilian story, it was back in the mid 70s around the first oil price shock that the, uh, the Brazilian government took the kind of forward looking approach to try and convert cars to alcohol to the development of cars to use bio, bioethanol, first generation ethanol from, uh, from sugarcane. So that was really stimulated and that production was stimulated and has grown since uh, as a result of security of supply issues. The second is the US and the previous administration the US put in place the big corn ethanol program which, which was in large part uh, a response to security of supply issues associated with having to import uh, uh, significant quantities of, uh, of, of crude from overseas. So uh, energy security has been a very important kind of motivator for the development of the biofuels industry, and that's certainly something that we've uh, uh, we try to embrace in our, in our biofuel developments within, uh, within BP. For those of you who may be familiar with the, uh, the BP 2030 outlook, this is a piece of work that we publish um, every, every year, uh, which is our view of the kind of the energy market trends uh, and to, to, to a degree a certain amount of crystal ball gazing about that, how those, those markets will trend into, into the future. And if we look at the old market and we look out to 2030, the current production roughly today is around 85 million barrels per day of, uh, of liquids, of, of crude. And as we go out to 2030, um, there will be more crude required, there will be more liquid transportation fuels required by, um, uh, by the global community, uh, and we see production rising to the levels of about 102 to 105 million barrels per day by 2030. That's actually a very, very significant rise in the demand for transportation fuels. And yet we're seeing a lot of, as, as the point that Graham made earlier, it's actually getting more and more difficult to find significant quantities of crude. And so we're seeing quite a large drop-off in, cr in crude production certainly from non-OPEC countries over the coming, uh, over the coming years, uh, with one exception which I'll come back to. Um, and that to an extent is being made up by um, three new sources of crude, um, more production in Saudi Arabia, um, so not new, but increased production from Saudi Arabia, which has phenomenal crude reserves. Um, secondly, Iraq. Iraq is going to be extremely important in the coming years. The amount of volume that Iraq can produce is very substantial. And then thirdly, NGLs. So they're the conventional, they're, they're the conventional crews that we, will, will be produced. But what we also see is the rise of biofuel production from its, its current uh, market share, which is around about sort of 3 to 3.5% 3 by energy, 5% by volume, to about 7% by energy, 10% by volume by about 2030. So for biofuels to take 10% of the liquid transportation market by volume by 2030 is pretty substantial. That, that will amount to about three to four, maybe five million barrels per, uh, 
um, per, per day of biofuels. That's an awful lot of biofuels. That's an awful lot of acreage that will need to be put under, uh, under production for biofuels. So I just wanted to put that kind of mass balance into context because biofuels is a, is a huge industry at scale. It will continue to compete and replace crudes uh, produced from elsewhere. And we in BP see that as a very large material and significant market opportunity. And that's why we've invested uh, several billion into the biofuels business to date. So, so that sort of sets the, the market context and why biofuels are important and volumetrically going to be significant in terms of liquid transportation fuels. But the next point I'd like to make is about biofuels um, and what really needs to be in place for biofuels to be successful. We see three major criteria. One is materiality and scalability. Again, if you're trying to pr produce um, fuels at scale, you really do need to be able to do this at scale, both agriculturally and also in terms of the conversion facilities. So scalability, materiality, very important, which demands large contiguous tracts of land for high quality, precision, sustainable agriculture. So that's, uh, that's point number one, uh, scalability is critical. The next thing is that it has to deliver great returns and it has to do it at uh, cost competitiveness. Now at the moment, the only biofuel um, that, uh, that, that we're producing that can compete directly with crude is Brazilian uh, cane ethanol. Now it can compete because it can be produced at around $50 a barrel of oil equivalent. The oil price is currently around $90 to $100. So as you can see, you can make quite a good, uh, good turn on first generation ethanol. Plus, you've got the scale in Brazil to be able to do it without subsidy. And it's quite critical to be able to see that we can make biofuels without subsidy because what the alternative energy does not want to be in the coming years is a continued kind of subsidy junkie. It's really important that these, these subsidies are seen as transitional incentives to help us to get to real competitiveness with, uh, uh, with fossil fuels. So, so being able to, to, to produce biofuels at kind of low cost um, with appropriate returns is kind of important point number two. And the third very significant point is all around sustainability. This has to be sustainable, sustainable from um, an environmental perspective, uh, from an agricultural perspective, and also from a, um, from a perspective of, um, if you like, um, social trends um, within particularly within sort of agricultural environments where we develop these biofuels. So, so putting in place new biofuel agriculture, putting in place new conversion facilities without having a kind of sustainable kind of workforce, without having trained and responsible people is also very difficult. So, so sustainability is critical in every, sense, in every sense of the word. So, so they're the kind of, if you like, the kind of macro factors that need to be put in place to ensure biofuels I think are successful, can be done at scale and can be done at a reasonable cost. We're involved in three areas around biofuels. One area is our Brazilian cane to ethanol business, where we've uh, recently uh, acquired three big um, conversion facilities, about 7 million tons of crush capacity. So we're, we're getting towards being one of the larger players in Brazil, but not the largest. There are many who have been there for many years who are more significant than we are. But we do see the scale of Brazil being very important. But that's all around kind of first generation cane to ethanol. The things that we're looking at in terms of future fuels are lignocellulosic ethanol. And we've, we're making a, a, a big investment in the US around the development of lignocellulosic ethanol, the conversion of cellulose and lignin, particularly the cellulose, into, into ethanol. Now that's actually a code that uh, many have tried to crack over the last sort of decade or so. Uh, and we hope to be um, um, announcing a, our first commercial plant uh, early next year which uh, we believe will be one of the largest, if not the largest, in the, uh, in the world when we, when we move forward with it. Uh, we've already started to build the agriculture around it because you need a f several years of agricultural cropping before you can actually start to move that, into, uh, move that into serious production. So that will demand tens to hundreds of thousands of acres of, of, of land um, created specially and on purpose for specific energy canes so these look like sugar canes, but contain little or no sugar, and you can effectively convert the whole crop uh, to, uh, to, to fuel. So we see that as a very exciting market. Um, now, th what's motivating us to do that is uh, a number of things. It's scalable. Um, we think in due course it will come down the cost curve. Uh, and also it's helping to kind of develop and sustain uh, new uh, rural agricultural communities, particularly in parts of uh, the southeast uh, of the U.S., so that's uh, cellulosic biofuels, and we think that there's a possibility of producing 50 to 100,000 barrels a day of biofuel from those, uh, from, from those crops 
come around 2020, 2025. And the third area is around actually advanced fuels. So this is not taking kind of ethanol as the kind of final um, biogasoline molecule, because actually ethanol is not a wonderful molecule. It doesn't have a great energy density compared to gasoline. It doesn't have great transportation characteristics, i.e. absorbs quite a bit of water. Uh, it doesn't have great combustion characteristics, and it doesn't have great greenhouse gas characteristics compared to a new molecule that we're trying to make called biobutanol. Now, you kind of say, well, if biobutanol is so much better than ethanol, why haven't you made it in the past? Well, it's actually extremely hard to make biologically. So biobutanol is a molecule that looks a lot more like a conventional gasoline molecule. You can actually blend up to 16% of it into gasoline rather than the usual 10% for ethanol. So it actually is a really great molecule if we can crack the code to make it. So we're working with DuPont to try and develop this kind of future fuel that we think, if successful, could end up replacing ethanol, um, bioethanol, as the key biofuel into the, into the market. We're not out of the kind of technical woods yet, uh, but we are producing batch quantities of, of uh, biobutanol at our facility up in, uh, up in Hull at the moment. Uh, and for those of you who uh, had the good fortune to experience transport in the BMW cars around the Olympics just now and to come at the Paralympics, we were able to put um, some demonstration <laughs> quantities, albeit small, of biobutanol into that BMW fleet, also some of our lignocellulosic ethanol generated in the U.S. into that fleet as well. So, so we, see a, we see a really bright future for biofuels. Uh, we think the end game may be biobutanol as the kind of the key molecule. Um, in the meantime, we're looking to convert um, the whole plant through cellulosic conversion into, uh, into ethanol and then eventually into, into biobutanol. So we're pretty excited by the, uh, by the biofuels investments that, we've, uh, uh, that, that we're making. Um, still some technology risk to go. Uh, the final thing I just want to say is that we're not only focused in BP on biofuels. Um, for future transportation, we need to understand the kind of the full gamut of, uh, uh, of future um, transportation opportunities, be it electric vehicles, be it hydrogen, and actually be it, uh, be it natural gas vehicles. And we'll hear a little bit more about that, I think, in a, in a, in a future speaker. So we have a corporate venturing arm that is making some venturing investments into, uh, into uh, new startup companies that are supporting our biofuels activities and also those supporting um, ele vehicle electrification. And there's a little article in, uh, in the Clean Tech Investor magazine that talks a little bit about some of our investments that we're making, making there. We're, we're quite excited about some of those. Uh, they're not only into things like new battery technologies, but also indirectly th through some of the funds we invest in, like Vantage Point and like Ching Capital, into new business models around vehicle electrification, such as Better Place, that. Uh, some of you will have heard about this morning. I'm sure we'll hear some more about over the course of today. So I hope that made sense and was reasonably coherent. Look forward to some questions at the end of the session. Thanks very much. time. I've gone as quickly as I can so that we can all get to our lunch fairly soon. Uh, thank you very much and I'd be happy to talk to people afterwards.